All right, good morning. I'm going to talk today a little bit about the idea of taking a life leap, uh, because that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in making a really big step forward uh, in a new direction. Uh, the direction is probably, uh, since it's a new direction, it's largely unknown, but, but I'm willing. Um, I talk to lots of people who feel like they are ready. They're ready for a next big step in their life. Um, so I think, why? Why is it a leap? Well, because it doesn't feel like there's anything under you when you leap, you know? It doesn't, it doesn't feel certain. So I remember from when I was a kid, the old movies about the circus, there are always these trapeze artists who at some point said, take down the net. I'm going to fly on the trapeze without the net, you know? And so um, there was nothing under them, no guarantee of their safety. Sometimes it worked out, sometimes not so much. Uh, but how, how can we make such a leap? And let me tell you what inspired me uh, around this. That um, some years back, I had been to Portugal a couple of times. My father's ancestors were all from Portugal. My grandmother and grandfather came from Portugal when they were very, very young. In fact, the story was that my, they put my grandfather on a boat at 11 years old and said, there's a better life for you in America. Go there. And that's what they did. And so um, my dad, from the time I was little, I remember my dad saying, someday I want to go to Portugal and I want to see the village where your grandfather was born. Someday I'm going to go to Portugal, I want to see the village where your grandfather was born. And, and every once in a while this would come up. And so here I am, an adult, and I've been to Portugal, and I said to my dad, I was visiting, and I said, I want to take you and mom to Portugal. I said, I can make the trip really easy for you. You know, you won't have to walk a tremendous amount. We'll get a driver, we'll get a guide, and you'll finally get to see where, where your dad was born. And my dad's response was, I'm too old now. You go and take some pictures. <laughs> and it was heartbreaking. It was absolutely heartbreaking, because in my mind, he was not too old at all. It's like, no, 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 you don't understand. I can make this really easy for you. I've been twice. I want you to see. And he said, no, no, no. So, I thought, you know, what, what really needed to happen there in his thinking from where I sat was he needed to be able to make a leap forward. You know, in A Course in Miracles, one of my favorite things, it says every day the teacher of God, who is all of us, has to get up and say, God, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say? And to who? You know, so really that's, that's another way of saying we lead a surrendered life. So just to ask the questions takes faith. To ask those questions takes a level of belief and trust. Because, you know, for, for a lot of people, it feels so, so out of control. But science of mind teaches us that there is a power in our creative thought, power to change our lives and to change the world that we live in. You know, we've all heard the expression that as a man or a woman thinketh so in his heart, her heart is she, right? So if we continued within our thought, uh, either contained within our thought is the ability to shape our destiny. We have that ability to shape our own destiny. So I really believe on a personal level, our destiny is in our own hands. It's impossible to think one thing and produce something else. We all understand that. So that must mean that my destiny actually has something to do with me, the way I'm thinking, the way I'm living. All right, I'll make it really plain. On a rerun of a Will and Grace episode, <laughs> Karen's mother-in-law says to Will, how do you expect anything in your life to change if you don't change. I mean, so it's even in will and grace now, OK? <laughs> uh, Karen's mother-in-law is in science of mind. You know? uh, not being in charge of our mental and spiritual household produces a life that is less than our divine potential. When we don't take charge of ourselves spiritually and mentally, you know, we, we are actually shortchanging ourselves. So the being in charge, is, I think, is, is an expression of our free will. Uh, to, to our ability to think constructively and creatively. You know, uh, this is, you know, when we pray in the science of mind, when we affirm, when we do spiritual mind treatment, we're setting a law in motion. And so choosing to cultivate a rich inner life, which is what I hope everybody who attends will do, you know, it, it, this, we do this through meditating, of course, through a practice of the presence, you know, because you, you work the law and you court the presence. That's what we teach. I've seen again and again that people have a fixed general, this is what I call a fixed general conviction in life. It's the way they know life to be, right? And it's just the way they hold life, and life all takes 
shape in this framework or container that they have. Um, now, that may actually be different than what they're praying for, than what they're affirming in mind currently. The fixed general conviction, though, that general state of how we view life and ourself and world and other people makes us what we are. So I think our mental conduct is contributing to, to the conditions we experience, obviously. You know, have you noticed how hard it is to change your mind concerning the things that really, really matter? I mean, it's difficult. I, I, I would be fibbing if I said it wasn't, right? Uh, it's these things that really matter that we seem to have difficulty getting a hold on, changing and keeping changed, those are the things that seem to really, really be molding our destiny. So it isn't a question of whether or not we will create life, right? The, uh, the question is what life will we create? You know? So what's the life we want to leap into? So the life my father dreamed of leaping into was a visit to explore his ancestry. We're created in the image and likeness of God. This is fundamental to what we teach. So I believe we have free will, we have choice, and that right there, to know we have free will and to know we have a choice every moment is extraordinarily powerful because this means that we are co-creators. We, we don't actually, we don't have a choice about being a co-creator, but other than that, we have choice. <laughs> you know, but most of us keep creating what we already know. Isn't that interesting? That we just keep creating what's familiar. So we wish, we hope, we consider that there might be other possibilities, but without a concerted effort in us of both mind and heart, of both love and law, of both principle and presence, life will not wind up looking very different. Right? I said to someone uh, recently, you know, if you would show me your calendar, you know, your appointments, and show me how you spend your money, you know, your, your Quicken page, I can really show you what you value most in life. You know, because that, and that's, that's an old idea. Where I'm putting my time and my money is really, really what I value. So I would ask you today to think about where do you put your commodity? Yes, your time and your money. Where do you spend time with, with family, with, with the important relationships? Where do you spend time working on your health and your body, um, your creativity, your inner spiritual life? Mm -hmm. Spirit, I think, is inviting all of us into the possibility of what God would express by means of us in a greater way. In other words, Spirit is inviting us into a greater possibility of what God would have us do. In the Old Testament, you know, it's a God of law, punitive, capricious. But in the New Testament, Jesus comes to tell us that God is also a God of love. Right? And so in Genesis, in the Bible, it says, God said, let there be light. All right? So into the void. Uh, what would you finish that sentence with? Let there be. Just think about that in your life. What do I want to say? Let there be, hmm, let there be health in my body. Let there be abundance in my bank account. Let there be loving people in my life. Let there be, because we, we do that all the time. So this week, I would invite you to challenge your old thinking, you know, because without challenging it, uh, that old thinking continues to be in charge. So, you know, when Adam and Eve were in, in the garden, in paradise, they were told to not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, now, that's a way of thinking, that there's good and evil. It's a belief in two powers. It's, you know, and the problem with that is, you know, it, we don't want to go there, right? But they can't help themselves, so they do. And they get cast out of the garden, and what do they feel instantly? They feel shame, because they don't know who they are, right? They ate and now believe that they are separate. Well, that really is the base of any problem we might have in our life, is feeling separate from God in that particular area. Um, scientists who uh, decide, uh, there was a group of scientists who decided they did not need God anymore. And they said, you know, because now we can clone out of the dust. We can make new life. So they, they essentially, they put God on notice. They said, we don't need you anymore. To which God responded, oh, really? Out of dust, we can create, huh? Well, well we, would, we would like uh, to demonstrate for this, this for you. And God says, okay, please. And so people gathered. And, uh, and if the scientists proved they could create the way God created, then God would no longer be required. And so uh, God said, out of the dust, I create. And then he does. And scientists said, well, we too can create out of the dust. And God said, uh-uh-uh-uh-uh, uh, 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 get your own dust. Mm-hmm, yeah. 
which points to what we teach in Science of Mind, that there's no place where God is not. So I would ask us to think about today, what is your heart's desire? If it comes from God, uh, that is not something that's supposed to keep us trapped and playing small, because God wants us to be fulfilled, uh, just like God wants us to be, you know, uh, successful and loved and abundant. If we are guided only by the intellect, we're going to lead a pretty small life. I think we'll experience lack, we'll experience limitation, frustration, dissatisfaction with ourselves, because we weren't created for just that. You know, and calling forth the greatness of God within you is not age-bound. Spirit is ageless. So if you're sitting there saying, well, I'm too old for this, no, you're not. If you're still here on earth with us, you are not too old for this because spirit that you are is eternal, is immortal, is ongoing. There are no new spirits. You know, our spirits have existed for eons and eons. So I think it begins with our mind to consider possible futures. If we think God has no place for me, wrong, God has a place for you, that's why you're here. You know, do you want to find your true place in life? Because without finding our true place in life, I think we'll never be really, really happy. You know, God doesn't repeat himself. No two people are exactly alike. So your true place doesn't look exactly like somebody else's true place. If you thought that was so, I think that's an error. So if we are unhappy, I wonder if we are not allowing the will of God to have free play in our lives. You know, people want to blame God. People like to blame other people for their troubles. But God operates according to law because God is principle. So there can be no room for the idea of blame. Really, blame is a very uncreative place. If you break a law, you suffer the consequences. That's just the way it is, right? But no blame, there's no punishment, there's just cause and effect, cause and effect. And yes, it hurts when we work against it, right? But it can also help you. It can heal you when you work with it. See, I think the human soul is like an opening through which the energy of God is seeking a creative outlet into the world, into life. If the outlet is clear, all is well. But if the outlet, if we are blocked, then the divine energy is frustrated, and then there are going to be stresses. And those stresses look like sickness and poverty and fear and anger and error and lack. So maybe the real art of living is to make the channel clear and keep it that way. You know, people work so hard to bring health and happiness and success and prosperity into their lives. But I think the idea of bringing them in is actually an error. I think what happens is that we have to release them from within us out. Because we teach in the science of mind that everything we seek is already contained within. Right? So it's not like I'm going to reach outside for prosperity and pull it into me. What I have to know is that the source of all prosperity is within me. And I have to open a way out for that to happen. And part of how I do that is I let go of all the stuff that seems to block it. My old stinking thinking, my limited believing, the negative conversation, perhaps bad practices. The poet Browning said that what we have to do is set free the imprisoned splendor. Isn't that a gorgeous idea? That there is within each of us an imprisoned splendor. So if we're not limited by our own fear, or our history, or our uh, current conditions, what life do I want to create if all of those limitations are gone? What would my life be like? What would my health be like? What would my relationships be like if all of those limitations were gone? How would I feel in my own skin? See, I think a key is to keep, uh, uh, to keep, forward, uh, to keep moving forward is to recognize I will not die with my music in me. Now, I know you've heard that before, but I love that statement, the idea of I'm not going to die with all my music in me. So the musician within us will cause us to step into a greater experience of ourselves. You know, so God made each, each of us for far greater than we know, uh, far greater than we have expressed ourselves to be thus far. We are all expressions of the divine. So uh, Abraham Maslow uh, said, a musician must make music, an artist must paint, a poet must write, and if he is to be at peace, if he is to be at peace with himself, what more what man can be, he must do. If we are to be at peace with ourselves, we have to do what we can do, what we came here to do, what we feel called to do. You know, what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, if I play the music that is within me, if I say yes to that possible future, it, 
it is not as bad as dying with the music within me, I'm certain. You know, that there's something, and what I'm talking about is what is that something within us that we want to experience or express, that we've maybe been saying no to? See, there's no failure there. It's, it's just a learning experience. It's just how we frame it. So in Zechariah, in the Old Testament, it says, this is the word of the Lord, not by might, not by power, but by spirit will all things be done. By spirit, all things will be done. And Jesus said, for with God, all things are possible. So our human mind argues all the time about what it knows is possible and what isn't possible. You know how that goes, right? So um, Robert Fulgham uh, told this story many years ago that in Eastern Europe, uh, in a city square, there was a statue of a man, uh, not a politician, not a leader, uh, but a statue of a man in a tuxedo playing a cello. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there were bouquets of 22 flowers in each bouquet all around him. Uh, and now I know it sounds like it might be um, kind of a nutty idea to celebrate a cellist as a national hero, but there was a man who lived in Sarajevo uh, who became so disturbed by the warring and the fighting and the political upheaval, the economic and religious persecution, that he thought, what could I, I'm just a cellist, what could I possibly do? And so his name was Vedran Smalvevic. Vedran Smalvevic. I'm, my my uh, language skills are not so good there. In July 1992, he decided to do something. He, a member of the Sarajevo Opera Orchestra, put on his tuxedo, his work attire, and he went down to the bakery where the day before there had been a huge bombing and 22 people had been killed. And he took a chair and his cello and he sat for 22 days and he played. And so over those days, more people began to catch the spirit. Uh, he was in the middle of where mortar had been f flying. You know, bombings were happening. Bullets three times passed right by him. Uh, but he sat there and he played. And others took up their instruments and went to other corners and began to play as well. And he played from a piece of music that had been saved from the Dresden fire bombings. Yeah. Now, is he crazy? Well, maybe. <laughs> right? um, is his gesture futile? Mm. In the conventional sense, what can one cellist do would it be madness to go alone into the streets and address the world, you know, with a wooden box and a hair string bow? I mean, what could one person do? All that he knows how to do. So people from Sarajevo, uh, Croats, uh, Croats, Serbs, Muslims, Christians, all know his name. They all place flowers at the shrine to, um, to Vedran flowers in bunches of 22. So in hopes that the best of humanity shall overcome the world. So Sarajevo is not the only place he is known. Uh, a woman in Seattle gathered musicians and for 22 days they played. The New York Times picked this up and musicians all over the country started playing. So I would ask us to think about what can you do well, all that you know how. And all that you know how is absolutely enough, right? If you think you don't know, then your job today is to ask God, what can I do? And then to very sincerely listen. Because I know where we have sincere questions, the universe has sincere answers. Um, my hope for all of us is that we don't die with our music in us. I know everybody is here like Ernest Holmes says, with a gift to give. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward for a moment to recognize we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit. And as we join in consciousness, knowing our connection with God, I further know for each and every one of us that we are all connected on the unseen side of life. And I claim for each and every one of us today that we are taking a leap forward in our life, that we are making tremendous progress in giving our gift to the world and doing what we came here to do and experiencing what we came here to experience and being all that we came here to be. 
I know that it is absolutely the will of God that each and every one of us experience great fulfillment in our lives. And so with open hearts and minds, we say yes to that. So although I individually don't know what you're here to do, to express, to experience, I know something within every person here does know that. And we turn to that presence now, and we stand as open, willing vessels for the Spirit of God within us to reveal what's up for us, where we're headed. We include in our prayer today our parents and children, our family members and friends, all of those we hold near and dear. And we know that right where they are, the presence of God is. We let our prayer, our prayer be a blessing today in the world. So all of those situations that pull at our attention, we say God is right there. As healing, as all needs met, as perfect order, as integrity, as right action. We bless our church. We bless all churches, synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together today that there is raising up, there is healing available for all of us, and we say yes to it. And so with an open, gracious, full heart, I give thanks that this is so. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.